So let's just go through, uh, since we're all kind of going to be talking today, the four of us will just do quick introductions. So my name is Annie Clad. I'm at University of Minnesota, and I'm the statewide extension educator for fruit crops. So I spend a significant portion of my time with grape growers. Amaya, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Amaya Tucha. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Horticulture at UW-Madison, and I'm also the fruit crop specialist for the state of Wisconsin. And I work with all, all fruit crops, but I spend a lot of my time working with grape growers. Leslie? All right, so I'm Christelle Guido. I'm the fruit crop entomologist and extension specialist and associate professor in the Department of Entomology at UW-Madison. So same that Amaya and Leslie, I cover all the fruit crops in Wisconsin and insects, pests, and pollinators. Welcome, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Leslie Holland, and I work on the pathology side uh, for all fruit crops, as Christrell and Amaya have mentioned, for Wisconsin. Okay, great. All right, it looks like we have a good, a good group today. We have about um, 30 or so uh, grape growers on the call, so thanks for joining us. So um, we wanted to kind of, there's a few things we wanted to talk about today, but maybe we should start the discussion uh, with just some canopy management topics. So um, Amaya, you said you were out in the vineyard recently, right? What are things looking like? Well, uh, with the recent rain that we've received, I feel like we are at that point in which vines that tend to be in bigger site are just like exploding. And just like we're seeing a lot of shoot growth and a lot of vegetation. And so in some of those um, high cordon is probably the time where you are already starting to see some of the shoots trailing down on the alleyway and, and might be, you know, that time of thinking about the first skirting, if you're skirting, uh, if you are on a VSP, uh, it also is probably the time where you can already see that your shoots are all the way up to the top wire and the trellis, and maybe some of them in the most bigger sites are already flipping over the, uh, the top wire. And so that would be another indication when those, when those shoots are all the way up there and they're folding on top of your fruit zone, it might be an indication that you would want to hedge those the shoots. So, so that's where we are here. We haven't, I think we're probably in southern Wisconsin, maybe two weeks to three weeks, depending on the weather from heating duration. So berries are expanding, but they're still pretty green and hard. Okay. And yeah, it's not too different. I don't have anything too unique to say for what's going on in Minnesota. That sounds pretty similar because just like you guys, we were, well, we're, we're still are in a drought, but um, we went for, I think, three weeks without any rain at all. And then we, a lot of Minnesota did have a rain last weekend and it rained um, for most of the state again yesterday. So uh, we have had some recent rains which, which are much needed, um, but I think growth was fairly slow for a while there, especially for newly planted vines. And so um, I think, especially for those new vineyards, we're thankful to have some water here recently. Um, so Amaya, you had mentioned hedging. Let's start with that. Mm -hmm. um, so when do you recommend that growers begin hedging, whether it be maybe VSP and high cordon? Um, at what point should you hedge and, and when might you be hedging too much or too often? Okay, so one of the things that we need to remember is that those leaves on those shoots are there for a reason. And the reason is that those leaves are the ones that are producing photosynthesis and they're producing carbohydrates that are the sugars needed to ripe those grapes. Okay, so that is why we have the leaves and the importance of having healthy foliage. And I know that you know, Leslie and Christelle will talk a little bit about diseases and insects that could affect that, but that's the reason why we, we want to keep those those leaves. So one thing to remember is that, that re research shows clearly that you need at least 16 healthy leaves per shoot to be able to ripe two clusters in that shoot. So you need to keep that in mind when you're hedging. If you hedge too much and you are you know, keeping those shoots really short and you don't have enough leaves, 
Then what you're going to do is you're going to delay fruit ripening and possibly never get to those bricks that you want uh, to harvest that fruit. So, so that's, that's one thing. So we want to hedge. When do we want to hedge? We want to hedge when those shoots, if you're in a VSP, so if your shoots are growing in a vertical position up, they are bending over the top wire and they're starting to shade those other leaves. So you're getting kind of like a double curtain. You have your shoot going up and then it bends and then you have another layer. When you're getting to that point, you want to hedge because you want those leaves not only to be healthy, but also to receive enough light to produce photosynthesis. So that is a good, uh, uh, that would be for me like the point where I would decide to start hedging when I can see that those shoots in the BSP are going all the way, all the way up and just flipping over and shading the, the, the shoot. For the high cordon, if you are in a high cordon, the same is true. You still need those 16 um, leaves to be healthy and, and totally expanded to be able to ripe those two clusters. I usually hedge, and in the vineyards, in the research vineyards, we usually, sorry, we usually skirt. Those means to cut those, that are, those shoots that are going down when they start trailing into the alleyway. Okay, that's, that's when I, I want to start um, skirting. I'm more of the theory of try to hedge and skirt as minimal as possible, only when needed. Because every time you do that, what you ended up having is, especially on cultivars that are very, very, very vigorous, Marquette, we all know about Marquette, is that you're going to get all these laterals that are going to start breaking because you are breaking off some of that apical dominance. And so every time you're cutting it, you're going to have more of those lateral shoots coming out and then more vegetation and more shade within your canopy. So a skirting or hedging only when needed. Don't go overboard with it. And, and always remember that you need those leaves to be able to ripe those clusters. Without those leaves, you're going to delay or you're never going to get to the brick level that you want. Thanks, Amaya. Uh, great answer. and. Um... I'll add something to that. Um, this is Christelle. So thinking about insects, right? If you have Japanese beetle that are defoliating your, your leaves, then you're better off leaving more than 16 leaves so that you can have some for the, the Japanese beetle, potentially for phylloxera or something like that, that could damage your leaves so that you have, like Amaya said, the minimum, but you also have like room for uh, feeding insects that you won't see as major damage because you have those, like, those minimum leaves that you need to ripen your clusters. So something to think about too. Yeah, and um, that's a great point as well. And you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure we, we did this question and kind of highlighted this question today is um, I have had uh, two or three growers, you know, in the last week or so um, ask me if they could cut off the shoots above the fruiting zone um, because they don't like the look of the large canopy on a high cordon vine drooping over uh, into the rows, but that's what grapevines do. That's how they're supposed to look. And so um, I would, it's just really important that people don't feel tempted to cut off too much, especially for the sake of aesthetics. Definitely not worth it. Um, and uh, the research that Amaya is referring to, there's actually been studies at Cornell to address this where they uh, did heavy summer pruning like that and they defoliated the vines and they really saw um, those differences in ripening and, and they saw that the vines had a really hard time making it through the winter. So, yep, um, thank you for Amaya and Christelle for contributing to, to that discussion. Okay, so what was the next thing we wanted to talk about? Aerial roots. Can yes. we, can we answer one of the questions yeah. that we have? Sure. Here on the Q and A, that given that it's about uh, cannabis management, yep. too late to lift pool. Actually, no. Perfect timing. At least here in south of Wisconsin, I know. If you are in the northern part of the state, or if you are in Minnesota, you might be delayed for a week from what we're saying here that we're a little bit warmer. Perfect timing for lift pooling right now. We we just did it in our research um, vineyard last week. Uh, this is the time. This is a time where you still have those um, berries that are small enough. They, they, they've been, if you leaf pull right now, those 
skins on those berries are going to thicken and they're going to grow well exposed to the sunlight so they won't have any sunburn. So, so this is a time to remove those two to three maximum leaves around the clusters to open up the canopy for more uh, light exposure. You don't want to do it after veraison, after the, the grapes start turning color because that's when uh, you're probably going to get some sunburn. All right, so let's go on um, to one of the pictures that we wanted to highlight. Um, and this is actually, can you see that? Can you see the photo? Okay. Yeah. And this is actually one of my photos. Uh, you know, we ask growers to submit photos for this, but uh, we didn't actually get too many. So we're sharing some of our own photos of, of related to questions that we often get this time of year. And so one of them is, this, what you see in this picture, and often the question I get is, what are these roots doing here? Um, so this is the, at the bottom of the photo, this is the cordon, and um, these are coming off of the spur. These are called aerial roots. So they actually are technically uh, root structures on the grapevine, but they're coming out of the canopy. And um, Dr. Eric Staffney down at uh, Mississippi State University did a study on aerial roots a few years back and I think what he was finding was basically aerial roots are gonna be more common on vines that are stressed and they're gonna be more common in vines that are in high humidity or high moisture environments. Um, the aerial roots in themselves are not going to do any damage to the vine. Uh, I just like to describe them to growers as like, this is a sign that your vines may be in an environment that they're not 100% happy with. Um, they're stressed or they're getting too much moisture. Uh, and so this is something that you do want to look for because it's just it's just a sign that your vines are are trying to to tell you something basically. Amaya, did you have something else you wanted to add on that? No, I know that there's been some you know theory. I don't know if there's any been any research that that suggests that aerial roots might also be produced when there's cold damage, a lot of a lot of damage. That that's another thing. But I think that you're spot on with with saying like if you see these it might be that there's some sort of stress, whether it's too much humidity or something that is making those vines unhappy. And that's why their, kind of like their way of reacting to that stress is to put out those, those um, aerial roots. I also, I've, I've seen them every year in the vineyard and, and a lot of the shoots actually, those aerial roots will dry up in the winter. And, and some of those shoots will just be just fine the next year when you spur them and, and that's it, nothing happened. It's not that you know the vines are going to die or you're gonna lose your shoots or your spurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and so I don't have anything to add on aerial roots. If people have follow-up questions on that, feel free to type them in the Q&A. Um, but we want to get on to, I think this is the, the last question for you know, overall you know, vine management. And then we're going to go into diseases and insect pests. But let's talk about uh, nutrition and petiole analysis. Um, and I would just start by saying that um, if you're just doing routine petiole analysis, the important times to do that are during bloom and verasion. And so Amaya, can you talk a little bit more about that as growers are thinking towards verasion and they need to do petiole analysis? Yeah, so I think, I mean, a lot of the growers know that there are, but we can, we can you know, review this again. There are two timings for those petiole samples. It's a bloom time or during midsummer. Uh, it's the two time where we say like around verasion is, is the time. So we obviously already passed the bloom time. And so now if you, if you want to sample, you can do it by variation. What I tell growers is like, be consistent with everything. Be consistent with the lab that you're using. Be consistent with the time of the year because not, you, you will not have the same um, range of, of normal, the normal range for each nutrient, depending if you're sampling in during bloom or during variation. So it's easier to just stick with one and every year do the same one. When, when, we, when we are gonna sample for um, petio analysis during midsummer at variation, what you wanna do is you want to sample from anywhere between the fifth or the seventh leaves from the tip all the way towards the base of the shoot that is fully expanded. 
that is the those are the leaves that you want to collect with the petiole and then separate the petiole from the blade of the leaf and then put them all and send it to the lab. So we've written so many articles about it between the ones in the Wisconsin Fruit News and the ones that Annie uh, puts in the fruit and vegetable newsletter in Minnesota. I'm sure that another one will be coming out just to remind them all, but, but keep in mind that within the next maybe two to three weeks, there will, that is gonna be the time when you start seeing Verizon to collect for petiole analysis. And this is something that I cannot stress enough. Every year, this is a way of checking. It's like when you go to the doctor and you do your annual you know, visit to the doctor, this is a way that you can see how things are changing, how nutrients are changing, whether you are coming into a nutrient deficiency pro or if you over fertilize with something this is where you see the trend. So having every year do the petiole analysis the same time with the same lab, it's really important to see long-term trends in the vineyard. Annie, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to say about the sampling. Yeah, sure. So I just shared a link in the chat, and that is the web page that we created over the last year um, that goes through how to do both tissue and soil nutrient testing um, for cold climate vineyards. And it, I believe it includes the videos that we have done on that as well. Um, and so I'm going to just share my screen again. Um, if you were to go to that link and open up this web page, this is what you're going to see. Um, and if you just scroll down, the thing that I want to highlight is, you know, everyone can send in their samples and they get their report back. And then the question is, how do I interpret this report and actually use it to inform the decisions I make in the vineyard? And so when you get those numbers on the report, the key is to compare them to something, um, compare them to the established, you know, sufficiency levels or optimus, optimal levels of uh, nutrients in those vines. And so there has been research that has gone into this. Um, several Midwest states, including Minnesota, I don't know if Wisconsin was involved in this um, back in 2015, 16. Yes, okay. Um, to determine what those optimal levels are. Um, and so these are the optimal levels that you can compare your uh, tissue test results to. And um, when you get your report back, depending on what lab you go with, sometimes they try to interpret those numbers as well. And so sometimes in the report, you'll see like low, medium, high, or excessive on the report, but those numbers are not always consistent with what the research in the Midwest has found. They might be comparing them to um, Norway or California or the Finger Lakes, and that doesn't necessarily translate to us here in the Midwest. And so uh, we really recommend using um, the, the numbers that were from research done here. So take advantage of uh, that resource that I shared in the chat. Okay. So Christelle, do we wanna move into some insect questions? Sure. Is there anything in particular you would like to tackle first or would you like me to lead in? <laughs> No, so what I would say <clears throat> at this time of the year in grape, um, as you probably have all noticed for the most part is Japanese beetle is what we started seeing in the last couple of weeks um, and really much more in the last week or so. Um, so that's not surprising. I think everybody has heard um, all of us talk about that and uh, what you need to do. Again, going back to the leaves and uh, um, the pruning and all that that you may be doing, um, you can tolerate a lot of damage from Japanese beetle. Uh, we're talking about a, a approximately a 30% uh, defoliation on the entire plant before you would possibly even see damage because the, the research has not shown any impact on the plant growth uh, with 30% um, uh, defoliation. So um, you can tolerate a lot. Again, if you only need 16 leaves for uh, two clusters to ripen, you can imagine that you have way more than that in most of your cultivars. And so um, you can give some to Japanese beetle. They're providing you with uh, free pruning pretty much. <clears throat> so think about it that way. And when you're trying to estimate this um, defoliation, you do not want to focus on those leaves that look completely skeletonized. You want to be looking at the entire plant, right? We're talking about an entire plant having 30% of damage and so please refer back to webinars that we've had in the past where I, I discussed that, but you really want to take an approach of the whole plant. 
Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about at this time would be a uh, Rose Schaefer. So maybe I can I can show you some pictures. I'll share my screen quick. Um, so oh, we can see your all your files and stuff. I know. All right. You have to open it because I it's okay. So um, Rose Schaefer. So this is a picture of Rose Schaefer damage, right? So if you see this, that looks very much like Japanese beetle. This is a pretty decent uh, looking defoliation and the leaf is pretty much, you know, completely dried up. Um, but I just want to point out that they will look similar to Japanese beetle. Um, and then they, um, what was I going to say? As far as the defoliation, again, it would be, um, I think it would be this one, right? When you're looking at this kind of um, damage, if you focus on leaves that are highly defoliated, like the one I just showed you before, for Rose Schaefer, you might be worried, consider the whole plant. And then I wanted to show you a picture of a Rose Schaefer, just so you can see what it looks like compared to a Japanese beetle, right? We all know what a Japanese beetle looks like. Rose Schaefer are, are pretty big. They, in comparison to Japanese beetle, similar in size, I would say, but they have these long brown dangling legs. They don't cause tremendous damage. They will defoliate the same way. They're, um, they're not gonna be active for the whole entire season either. They're more in sandy soil. Um, that's where they lay their eggs. So sandy soil vineyards will have more of a problem with Rose Schaefer, but similar damage in Japanese beetle. So you can again tolerate quite a bit of uh, defoliation. Um, so that's that's what I wanted to say about what you would be seeing at this time of year um, that you you would want to pay attention to. And then there's phylloxera that you're still probably seeing. Um, the, the goals are still here, um, but you're pretty much at the end of the windows for managing them. There's no point in really going any further uh, with management for phylloxera from now on. Um, and really, again, that goes back to your leaves. So... Uh, what are you seeing when you have phylloxera goals like this? You have your leaf that's fully expanded. You don't have any issues. So these leaves are pretty, uh, like very typical of a grape phylloxera. Um, if you have your leaf that's fully expanded, again, the leaf is still doing what it needs to do. It's still providing the photosynthesis that um, is needed to ripen your clusters. But if you have a heavy infestation, and of course now I want... Uh, I won't find it because I didn't label it, did I? Oh, I wanted to point out with this picture that sometimes those, those goals look red on the phylloxera that might be looking like grape to milk goal maker, but I don't need to go into that um, as far as like comparing them at this time of the year, but earlier in the season, if you see those goals that are red, um, it could be grape to meet goal maker, which will look different and will look um, something like this um, that are can look like a great phylloxera, but then if you look at them closer, they're smooth and they're different. Uh, when, whereas the uh, um, great phylloxera are more like this wart looking um, goals that you see. Also, grape to meet goal maker can do this on the, on the stems. Um, and then, I, yeah, I, I can't find, but you can see what, oh, here it is. That's this one. So that's when you have a problem with grape phylloxera, right? When you have so many goals that the leaf curls up. So that's when what you want to be paying attention to. But at this time of the year, um, you might do, do a last spray and then you're pretty much done um, for, for grape phylloxera. That's all I had for this. Thanks, Christelle. Um, so I got a photo from somebody, I think it was this morning or yesterday, um, of leaves inside a grow tube that were decently defoliated. I'm just going to share that photo and see if you know what is causing this damage. Can you tell, Christelle, from that photo what this, if this is Japanese beetle or something else? Um, I followed up with him to ask if if he saw any Japanese beetles around, but I haven't gotten any answer yet. 
I mean, that it's hard to tell because the leaf is also all curled up, but that could definitely be Japanese beetle. I mean, they feed between the leaves and that's the veins. I mean, and that they, they do not feed as opposite to apple leaves. They don't feed on the surface of the leaves. They cut through the leaves. But there's other insects that do that, right? The, the fact that they go between the veins could be rose schaefer, could be Japanese beetle. But the most likely culprit um, in, in our vineyard in the region is Japanese beetle. So I would suspect it's not going to be something like a cutworm or something like that, because they would just do chunks on the side of a leaf, you know, like a moth, um, a moth um, caterpillar. But this kind of damage, I would suspect, is Japanese beetle. Okay, and then do you have any suggestions then for somebody who has grow tubes on the vines and needs to control Japanese beetles? Do they spray down into their grow tubes or what? So the leaf was in there? Oh yeah, all of these leaves were growing inside the tube. Oh, and is that a sandy soil? Oh, I don't know if it was sandy soil. I got very minimal information yeah. from the person who asked the question. Well, yeah, I mean, but you're not going to spray if you don't see any Japanese beetle, right? So that would be, first we need to know, make sure that they have the insect in question. Well, we at, do, let's say there are people who, who do have Japanese beetles present. So in that case, not this particular uh, oh. grower necessarily, but if they do have Japanese beetles present and, they, and it's damaging the new vines inside the grow tube. Well, you need to protect those new vines. There's no doubt that you need to protect them. So um, Rose Schaefer, you really need to protect those new vines as well. So yes, I, I would say you need to apply something to protect those vines. But do, should they spray directly down into the tube or? How That's do they a good that? question. I don't know. I've never heard of that before. So I've never seen anybody growing those two. I, if you don't, I mean, if they're so small, I don't know. It, it's all dependent on how many vines you have, right? Because if they're so small and you don't really see a lot of insects, then going in there and then removing, handpicking those, those insects would be one way of doing it. But if within the grow tube, grow, grow tube, I don't know. I really don't know of any research on this case. And I would apply something to protect those vines probably early. Maybe something to apply in that case would be something like surround, like the kaolin clay. Especially if you don't see the insects, maybe that's something you can apply that will protect, like be a, a deterrent, right? So that could be something that people would consider, but I don't know, it's a good question. I don't, I've never seen anything in, in those grow tubes like this. So at least in Minnesota, the grow tubes are fairly common. It allows growers to apply herbicides around the vines without damaging the vines. And that's the main purpose of them. Okay. Um, but I guess maybe one idea is, so Japanese beetles, you know, in our area, we start seeing them beginning of July. Um, if if your weed pressure isn't that bad at that point, you could consider doing one last pre-emergent plus post-emergent herbicide application and then removing your grow tubes, which would allow you to spray for Japanese beetles because you're going to need to remove your grow tubes in August anyway in order for your vines to harden off for the winter. So maybe just control your weeds the best you can and get them off of there. I was going to suggest exactly the same. I think that in the case that, that you have this kind of problem, and as you said, your past, you know, maybe the, the timing where you have most of your weed pressure and you've already controlled your weeds, it, it's about just remove them and just make sure that you're controlling just Japanese beetles. Because if you have a high infestation and you can't control them, then those vines are not going to go anywhere. They're not going to grow. You won't have enough leaves. And it's highly probable that those vines are going to be weak during the beginning of the fall and you could get either, you know, cold damage. So you want to make sure, again, the concept of having healthy foliage is really important, whether it's to ripen your fruit or in this case, just to establish those vines properly so that they can survive the winter. So I would agree. If, if you feel like you have control enough weeds and you can remove those um, tubes, this is the time. You're going to have to remove them anyway. Yeah, you do want to protect those vines. Okay, that was awesome. Um, all right, while I'm still sharing my screen, how about this picture, Christelle? This is one that we don't see too often. 
in our area, right? Yeah, so probably grayberry moth, right? Um, that's one that in, and I don't have the answer to that, unfortunately. That used to be the, the main pest of, of grapes in Wisconsin, and it's not at all anymore. So it's a very interesting because it used to be, it's still a big, big issue in Michigan. Why that happened that in Wisconsin, somehow they're not here anymore. But every time I've asked grape growers in Wisconsin, who has a problem with um, grape berry moth? No one who's monitoring for grape berry moth. You have all the tools that you need to manage those insects. They're moths. We have pheromone traps. You have all the different strategies. And Michigan still has a lot of uh, active research on this. Uh, there's very few people that even monitor for them. There's three generations per year. So you want to be paying attention if you have them. So if you're worried, if you see symptoms where you start seeing the larvae, the stung berries, like you might have a red dot or area on your berries um, at, at this time of the year, and then they start kind of webbing and you see a lot of, um, you know, you might see larvae, you might see uh, pathogens that get into those berries that have been stung, et cetera, or webbing of the leaves because they protect themselves within the leaf. So they cut a section and then fold that over and, uh, and, and web that together. If you see that, you definitely need to monitor. You definitely need to pay attention. Um, but the likelihood of you having a heavy infestation of them in our area is really low. We really don't see them. We really don't have an issue with them. The people that have told me the monitor never apply management strategies for them. So there's insecticides, of course, that you could apply. But um, Annie was uh, forwarding me a paper that was looking at economic threshold for great berry moth. And so what they're suggesting in that research was 10 to 20% of clusters that are damaged with great berry moth, again, very specific to great berry moth, is when you would need to apply an insecticide and you've reached economic injury level or economic threshold or action threshold. The likelihood of people having heavy infestations to the point where they see 10 to 20% of their clusters infested with grapeberry moth, I would say is really low. And Annie, I think you agree with me on that, that we, we don't see those kind of levels. You might see something like this, well, yes, you might have a berry, but that's the only cluster where you see that in, a, in I don't know, 100 clusters that you're checking or something like that. Anything you want to add, Annie? Um, nope, I think, I think that hit the nail on the head. I think that was great. I have a question. If I were a grower, I would, I would ask this question. Is this something that we don't see a lot of this issue just because the conditions are not here or the cultivars that we grow are not favorable for, for the moth? Or is this something that we just delay? Like we know that with invasive species, there's this, you know, this process that, says that they start moving geographically until they arrive eventually to where we are. Is that the issue here? Could the growers, would the growers start monitoring with the idea that this might become an issue or not really? No, and actually, I don't recall as of, of the top of my head if it is, I think it might even be a native insect. So I would say, no, it's not one that is going to uh, become a pest anytime soon, as far as we can tell. It's not like it's one that just showed up. It was a pest in the past. It's still a pest in Michigan. It was a, a pest in the past in Wisconsin. My predecessor was saying that it was the number one key pest of grapes in Wisconsin. And it's not at all anymore. So I think we are on the, on the opposite end of this. And why, like I started by saying that, I don't know why. I don't know why it used to be a major pest. And now it's not. It's probably due to some of the pesticides we've been using. And we decreased that population really well. It could be that somehow there are biological control agents that are, you know, somehow uh, maintain those populations very low. We could get a resurgence of them at some point or another. That's a possibility. But, but really, um, I think that right now, it's not something that I would caution growers they should monitor and pay attention to. I would say if you see that, then if you see the damage sign that uh, Annie was showing or the folding of the leaves, like a little, a little chunk that's chewed up and then that's folded over and there's a larva in there that 
folded that little piece uh, over, if you don't see any of that, I wouldn't worry about it at all. Or if your neighbor tells you, then put a monitoring track. Okay, so we have um, two questions in the Q&A that are related to insect pests, and then we're gonna quickly transition over to diseases because Leslie's been um, following along very patiently. <laughs> and I'm sure people have a lot of questions about diseases as well. Um, so real quick, these first, these two questions in the chat, um, I'll do this one because first it seems more straightforward. Every year I find a few grapevine beetles. I never worried about them. Is that a mistake? And she's got the taxonomic name in there. Pel Pelinota puptata, perhaps. I'm not familiar with that. I am not either. I just copied it and pasted it. I can see a picture of it. I've never seen that in grapes. I would say with any insect that you see, um, especially when it has in the name grapevine beetle, right? So it's possible you see it, but I would suspect that if you don't see them in high numbers, you don't have to worry about it. Um, you're seeing a few grapevine beetles, then any insect, it's the numbers that matter, right? It's not gonna be, there's few that know the, it's different, but for the most part, it's the numbers that will matter. So if you don't just see a few, I wouldn't worry about it at all. They've never been seen, uh, as far as I know, in the Midwest as any kind of um, economic uh, of insect of importance, of economic importance. All right, thanks. And then um, this next question, uh, resources for pet, insect pest management for cold climate, biodynamic or organic vineyards. Can you quickly, Christelle, just give your take on that? Um, but there are resources, there are some uh, for organic vineyards uh, from Cornell. I don't know, Leslie, if you have a chance to, uh, to uh, type I that in there. It. You I did it? It and, and I don't know if, if I'm going to put it in the, in the chat also for the growers that are not, or the, the attendees that are not following the Q&A. Here it is. This is posted in our website. That's the 2016 Organic Guy Production from Cornell. It's yeah. for mostly vinifera but it also most of it is also i guess applicable to cold climate grapes and it's it's an entire production guide so it's not only insects and and diseases but it also has you know nutrients and and, and wood management i'll also just quickly throw in uh they also just came out with the 2021 version of that guide um so i just put that in the chat as well so pretty much probably the same of what amaya just copied but maybe if there's new registrants for organic products there, there would be in this guide. So. And, and what I would say too is that if you look at articles that we, we put together for the Wisconsin Food News, we always cover um, what are the cultural control practices that you can use. If there's any biocontrol, we talk about them. And we try to really hard to provide organic um, con and insecticides that you could use, at least for insects and, and diseases. We try to always cover um, the organic options as well. And cultural control practices or biocontrol work with both conventional and organic. But this is a great guide. We use it all the time. All right, so that's a, a good transition over to you, Leslie. Ready to talk about diseases? Sure, let's do it. Okay, um, so one thing maybe generally uh, that, you know, I've been wondering with all this abnormally dry weather that we've been getting, um, how wide can a grower make their spray intervals? I mean, if it's not raining for three weeks and they already sprayed the last time it rained, do they, do they need to spray again and, until it rains next? You know, it's a really good question. I've definitely been getting a lot of that question this season, considering the conditions. Now we have gotten a lot more rain in Wisconsin lately, uh, but before we were kind of in a drought period, but typically when you see that range on your fungicide label, seven to 14, seven to 10, uh, that that higher end of the range, that 10 day, that 14 day, that's intended for when disease pressure is very low and conditions are not conducive. So when we think about drought, conditions are not really conducive for most of the fungal pathogens you would encounter in your vineyard. So you can stretch it out to that higher end of the range. Um, in really prolonged situations, you do have to keep in mind that the plants are going to be stressed because of drought. Now, surely I'm sure most folks are irrigating and, and supplementing in that way, but the plants are still going through um, a, a different level of stress, a different kind of stress. So I would say in addition to being able to stretch the interval to that higher end, really keep an eye on your scouting. 
um, as well. Because again, if another rain comes in, it, that situation can really catch up with you. So I would just keep it no longer than that higher end of the interval. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's been some discussion that you've been part of over a couple of emails on a disease that I'll admit I hadn't heard of before. Maybe I had seen it um, out in the vineyard, but not known what it was. I will open that picture up here. This one, we received this from a grower on the border of Minnesota and Wisconsin last week. Yes, so this is, and this has been a chat, I think, uh, even beyond Wisconsin and Minnesota as of recently, but Rupestris speckle. And it's actually, I think it's thought to be a physiological disorder. So not necessarily a pathogen being associated, but just the disorder of the plant. And you hear that Rupestris, right? So Vitus Rupestris is uh, um, a different species of uh, Vitus. Um, and so any grapes with that kind of in their background are known to occasionally have Rupestris speckle. Um, and so it can really vary on grapes from my understanding. Um, it tends to kind of shift towards one side of the leaf. It usually shows up, shows up on the leaves as like little kind of brown freckles or speckles uh, on the leaf. And in really, in cases where your vines tend to be really stressed, let's think about drought, let's think about cold damage, or just in general weak, you're actually gonna see kind of more severe rupestris speckle. So by that, I mean, you're gonna see a lot of those brown speckles start to merge or coalesce into larger areas. So if you are seeing more severe repestrous speckle, it's oftentimes going to be um, on vines that are experiencing more stress um, for whatever reason. So it's definitely been popping up a lot lately. There's no management. Like I said, it's more kind of what has to do with the genetics of some of the hybrids that we're growing in Wisconsin and Minnesota and elsewhere. Um, and so most of the time, from my understanding, it does not seem to have a significant impact on the vine. It obviously looks unattractive. Um, so I completely understand the concern, but from what we understand, not a disease. Annie, I have another picture of the same, the repressed receptacles, if you want me to share them so that growers can see, because th this is on the underside of, of the leaf. I have one that you can see those more like brown. Yeah, go uh, ahead and share your screen. Here it is, I don't know if growers can see there. I can make it a little bit bigger. Can move this out of here. Can you see that? This is a picture yep. that Tim Martison shared with me, but you can see those those little dots there. They're more like brown, different from, but those that that's a classic uh, symptoms from these these uh, repressory speckles. So if you see, see something like this, uh, just send us a picture, send us an email. We we can look at it that way. But but Leslie is is right. Anything that is something like it's just stressing the vine, just abiotic stress, not necessarily. It's just like heat um, or cold damage or drought could just make this more prevalent. Amaya, yeah. Go ahead, Leslie. I was just going to add, I know for a lot of growers, initially looking at it, probably walking past in the vineyard, it does look very similar to uh, black rot uh, lesions that you might see in the leaves. And so remember with that, um, oftentimes, if you have your hand lens with you, you'll be able to actually look closer into those lesions and see uh, the fungus sporulating or producing those fruiting bodies. So that'll be a good way to differentiate. Rupestre speckle does not actually produce a fungal structure, right? Because it's not caused by fungus, whereas black rot does. So it's a good way to differentiate if you're confused. But again, also send us pictures. Okay. Um, I, and I was going to say, too, that maybe this is just reiterate the point you just made that it's important to send pictures or sometimes even submit a sample to the lab um because i could see how that could be mistaken for potentially like nutrient deficiency or even phytotoxicity i mean especially if you're not familiar with the disease and seen it a lot i can see how that could be confused easily um, there's a question in the q and I love this question. When it comes to the management of first and second leaf, meaning non-bearing vines, new vines, what's the current recommendation regarding fungicide usage? Can we get away with few or even no applications? Or will this lead to a buildup of inoculum for the following season? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think I've, I've heard either way on this. I think my best advice to you is I think, yeah, you still need to manage, right? Because you don't want anything to overwinter down the line, but that level of care can be a little bit different compared to when you have fruit. So I guess what I mean by that is you don't need to put the best, most expensive fungicides on those plants during the growing season. If you've got some other ones that get the job done, maybe not as robust as the ones you'd use once your plants are starting to bear, that's a fine way to manage those grapes before you're actually starting to get fruit, so. Awesome, and then Leslie, in general, um, this season, since it's been so much drier than normal, have you been seeing, you know, less disease out there or just different um, relative densities of disease species? Yeah, so that's it. So initially, like the, coming back from Wisconsin, and we do scout the the Madison Wisconsin vineyards for weeks. We weren't seeing much of anything, um, and I say within the recent couple of weeks with the rain and then really the humidity, I think is what kicked things off because it was pretty hot and dry. But with recent humidity, recent rain, we've actually seen a pretty significant takeoff and powdering mildew. Um, and so again, that's on pretty susceptible varieties like Brianna, for instance. We know Brianna is just it's highly susceptible to powdery mildew. So we're seeing that on berries, we're seeing that on rakes, we're seeing that on the leaves as well. So I'd say that one has taken off. We already, we typically see black rot, but nothing too concerning in terms of the density in the canopy, but I would say powdery mildew has really picked up. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, one more short disease thing. And then we forgot to talk about one of my favorite pests. So, We'll get back to that in a second. Um, okay, so this photo, uh, this is one, oh, it, it came up kind of blurry on my screen because it's such a large screen. So hopefully this looks kind of clear to you. Um, this is something that uh, I was out at a, a big vineyard in Minnesota about two weeks ago and we were seeing a lot of this. It's um, these necrotic brown, uh, crispy spots on the edges of leaves. Um, they're kind of a random shape and they have this kind of yellow halo around them. And at first I thought, oh, well maybe that's just some leftover uh, leaf necrosis from frost. I didn't think anything of it until the grower told me that he's been experiencing this in the same part of his vineyard for three years. And so, you know, then there's more red flags. Um, so I emailed some uh, plant pathologist at the University Department of Agriculture, or sorry, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and she told me, oh, that's actually something that we are interested in monitoring, um, because this symptom where you've got this um, irregular spot of dieback on the edge of the leaf with the yellow halo around it, which is key, that yellow halo has to be there, um, she said that it could be one of two diseases of concern that the Department of Ag is trying to keep track of because the more they can learn about how common it is in our region, the more we can develop recommendations for how to control it. So it's, our, it's to our benefit if we help each other understand how widespread it is. Um, so basically the ask from the Minnesota Department of Ag is, if you see this, just let us know. You know, you can let Extension know, you know, let Leslie know, let me know, depending on what state you're in, um, that, uh, that you might have something like this and we can check it out. Um, so just as an FYI, the two diseases that it might be are angular leaf spot or something called rotor brenner. But I wouldn't get yourself too concerned about the, you know, the, the impacts of the disease right now. It's mainly a uh, foliar disease um, and very rarely seems to affect fruit. Yeah. Anything to add on that? I think the only thing I'll add, um, and of course, keep an eye on that, especially with constant growers, if that comes up for you, please feel free to contact me. Happy to take a look at any photos to help kind of diagnose. Um, but Annie brought up a good point talking about that halo kind of that we're seeing around that lesion. Um, oftentimes when we think about these different physiological disorders versus uh, biotic or, or issues, diseases caused by pathogens, um, sometimes that halo can be a good distinguishing factor, not all the time. Um, so just as you're starting to look at things like with Thermopsis leaf spots, we often see a little yellow halo. Uh, initially, um, we see just yellow initial spots for downy mildew. So some of these things can start to guide what you're seeing in terms of diagnosing on the actual uh, leaf surfaces. Okay, thanks. 
All right, so the next test has to do it, uh, you know, it kind of intersects insect and disease management. Um, we had a whole webinar having to do with this last year by Megan Hall around this time of year, if you might remember, uh, is SWD and sour rot. So um, maybe we can start with Christelle. Uh, we know SWD, spotted wing drosophila, is out now. You know, it's uh, our trapping in Minnesota has found that it's it's out there in um, in all of our trapping sites. That's common for this time of year. It usually starts being seen around the end of June and continues through the rest of the season. But Christelle, when do grape growers really need to start worrying about SWD? Okay, so there's two parts and you alluded to that at the beginning, right? There's the first part of what's the impact of spot ring drosophila by itself on our cold climate grapes. So I'll start with that. Um, what we've seen with wine grape cultivars, the cold climate grapes, is that um, this is a fly that can cut the skin of the fruit in general, and they cut the skin of ripe and ripening fruit. They cannot cut the skin of wine cold climate grapes. We've done um, extensive lab assays. They are not able to cut the skin. We tested only six or seven cultivars, but we also had something like eight different cultivars that we assessed in the field for larval infestation and had very, very low larval infestation in all the cultivars we tested in the field, like less than one larva uh, per fruit or per gram of fruit. It wasn't even per fruit, so very, very small. And then um, in the lab, they could not infest a single one of those uh, sound grapes. So our recommendation from a standpoint of just the damage that spot wind rosafla can cause to or cold climate grapes and wine grapes only. I'm not talking about table grapes because there are some like Somerset that seem to be more susceptible. But when we talk about the wine cold climate grapes, uh, our recommendation is really just check fruit for larvae inside. Do not spray it because you're seeing flies out there because the flies are there and they're not just spotted wing drosophila. You're gonna have your drosophila melanogaster that are very actively present in your vineyards and so are in your kitchen. So they're everywhere. These flies are ubiquitous, the uh, melanogaster especially. So we do not recommend to spray because you see flies. They cannot infest your ripe fruit, let alone your green fruit. So right now is not a time to be spraying for your uh, uh, drosophila, whatever drosophila they are. Only spotted wing could and can't cut the skin of the fruit. The other cannot do that. But even spot wing drosophila cannot infest, is not interested in infesting green fruit. So now is not the time at all. That's talking just about um, the impact of spotted wing drosophila and drosophila in general on grapes. Um, when it comes to the association of spotted wing drosophila and drosophila melanogaster with cluster rot, then there's that whole webinar that Annie mentioned where yes, indeed, those drosophila flies have been associated with scaring the, um, the pathogens for cluster rot. But that would also be something that happens once your fruit is already compromised, then any fly is fair game is gonna be fruit and transmit pathogens at the same time. But the research from Megan Hall has shown that if you control flies at the time where the fruit becomes susceptible to cluster rot, you can decrease by controlling. It's not the vector, it's one of the vector of the pathogens. It's not the only ones, but when there's alpha, there's alpha melanogaster, you also have kind of um, abiotic uh, factors that may move those pathogens around or other um, uh, vectors. At that time, yes, it will help in controlling the flies to control the cluster rot, but or sour rot, I'm sorry. I keep saying cluster instead of sour rot. But that's not something you would do if you do not have symptoms of sour rot or a history of sour rot. I'm not doing Hope that makes sense to people. And Le Leslie or Annie, feel free to add to that. But I would recommend to watch the webinar if you have that issue. Yeah, and um, the time when the, the vine, when the clusters become susceptible to sour rot, um, Megan talked about that in the webinar. Uh, it was a certain bricks and it was, we're very, very far from it. Now, it, it was something like 13 or 16 bricks is when you need to start looking out for sour rot and then start controlling for it. Leslie, 
Um, do you remember, you know, what some of those recommendations were? Um, once you actually uh, get to that point, what do you spray? I, don't, I know that there's um, tank mixes with insecticides for Drosophila, I think at that time. Off the top of my head, I'd have to check the Midwest guide. I can and, and follow up. But yeah, that is the time that you're trying to manage. And ahead of that, if that's an issue that you've had in the past or concerned about, is really just trying to protect the berry from getting damaged, right? As Christelle was saying, they're, they're not actually, these just uh, flies aren't getting in the berry. It's bird, it's whatever else is causing damage to your berry. And even on top of that, if your berries have been impacted by something like powdery mildew really severely prior to verasion, that's gonna weaken them and make them more susceptible to something like botrytis or a sour rot, so. And at that time, you're gonna to have to pay very much attention to your pre harvest intervals. Right, and so the number of products that you can apply at that time are, for flies are going to be very limited. So I would say if you're looking at uh, controlling flies um, very close to harvest at that time when the bricks is already getting pretty high and you're soon to harvest, would be um, uh, some kind of a pyrethroids or even exorol is one. I think I would have to double check. I'm sorry, what's labeled on grapes? So off the top of my head, I can't remember, but something like. Uh, Mustang Max or um, um, yeah, Exerol is one. I mean, there's several insecticides in the pyrethroids that you can apply even in the organophosphates that would have good activity. I wouldn't apply any kind of neonicotinoid on spot green drosophila because those don't work. And then for organic growers, um, Entrust Spinozid is really the one that you would want to be applying. That's the only one that has a strong efficacy for spotted wing that will be uh, registered on grapes. And then if you um, needed to do a second application, then you could go with something like Pyganic, for example, the pyrethrins. Um, so that would be the recommendation. Okay. And then with sour rot, um, Megan was recommending doing a tank mix of the insecticide with uh, one of the products was Oxidate. And Oxidate is, um, what it does is it dries up the berries that have been infected by sour rot or have been damaged by, let's say, bird feeding or splitting. So using both the insecticide and the oxidate together was found to be more effective on sour rot than just using um, the oxidate on its own because the, the fruit flies are a vector of that disease and helps the disease actually get into the berry. Okay, we're almost out of time. Um, so I think that's great, you know? Um, we didn't get to all the photos, but I think we got to the highest priority ones. Um, the others I was gonna show are just herbicide damage and um, what looks to be sunburn. Maybe I'll just share this photo of sunburn real quick. Um, okay, so this is something that can be confused for hail damage, of course. So if you see uh, some, what looks like rotting or shriveling on the berries, but you don't see any signs of uh, clear disease and uh, the berries are clearly not ripe yet, um, then think about has it hailed recently or think about, do you have clusters that are strongly exposed to the sun? Did you just do really drastic leaf pulling? Because if you do really late leaf pulling, um, that sudden shock of the clusters being exposed to a lot more sun than they're used to, can cause some sunburn. So just think about the context clues and what's been going on. But both hail and sunburn are, are things that cause damage that can be examples of how sour rot or uh, fruit flies can get into those grapes once they actually start ripening. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us in this discussion today. And thanks everyone for the questions that you submitted. If you have additional questions for us, um, we both, we shared both of the newsletters, the University of Minnesota Fruit and Veg News, as well as the Wisconsin Fruit News. We post weekly articles on both of those newsletters, and um, there's some really good stuff for grape growers on there, so check those out and subscribe. Um, if you're in Wisconsin, contact one of uh, these Wisconsin folks, and if you're in Minnesota, contact me, and we will, we will help you out and get you some answers. Thank you, everyone, and thanks much, Annie, for, for leading us into this. All right. Thank you. And we will uh, send you the webinar recording when it's posted. Thanks. Yeah, I share, I share there in the chat, and, and Annie, I, I know that you can also share the one for Minnesota where the recording from, for this webinar will be posted. 
Yeah, I'll just share mine in the email because I don't want to bring it up right now. But. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Have a great week. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.